if you're talented, you'll move up pretty fast. But I think it's to behave with absolute integrity. If you behave with absolute integrity, um, then who you are and your faith is going to shine through, even if you don't, even if you're not overt about it. You know, um, I didn't walk around saying, hey, I'm Catholic, but people, you know, they, they finally, at the end, they, they, you know, toward, toward the end of this long career, they have realized that obviously um, God plays a role in my life and they're, uh, that's just who I am. Welcome to Apostolicum Actositate, an interview series on effective apostolic activity for the 21st century. My name is Christopher Pereira. I'm the CEO of Tepeyac Leadership. And I'm Andreas Whitmer, a director of the Sioka Center for Principal Entrepreneurship at the Catholic University of America. Thank you wow. so much all for joining us and for watching. Today we are interviewing Monica Hannon. She's a renowned journalist who will be with us and sharing her uh, work path in, in professionalism. Uh, thank you for joining Apostolic in Monica. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. If you, if you would please, Monica, get us started by just sharing a little bit about yourself uh, with, our, with our audience. Well, sure. Um, I've been a journalist for about, uh, I hate to tell you, but about uh, 40 plus years now. Uh, started out in newspaper, ended up in uh, television, and I'm an anchor, and uh, I got a a few years ago, I decided that uh, I wanted to go into management, so I studied up on that and uh, was the news director for about 10 years. I decided that that was taking me too far away from news, and so I became managing editor so I could be in charge of content uh, more readily. And uh, since then, I have uh, been the managing editor, and I anchor the 5, 6, and 10 at KFYR TV in Bismarck. Now, this is going to be a very interesting interview because the media, it's not an area, it's not a field that today we, we would think of as readily welcoming to the gospel, Monica. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think that that is certainly true. Uh, it's uh, something that we actually don't talk much about at, in our work setting. Uh, and uh, now in my situation is a little bit different in that in North Dakota, it's a very... Um, there are a lot of Catholics here and a lot of Christians. And so it's not people here because I've been here for so long, know my faith background and they've accepted that, but we certainly don't talk about it very much. But uh, for a long time, I was on a talk show. Uh, I, I hosted a talk show and there you were a little bit more free to talk about who you are and, and what your beliefs are. And so through that, the community really pretty much got to know that I'm Catholic and um, you know, but during the newscast, of course, we certainly, do not talk about that. And um, you can't really, as a news manager, I can't push my own agenda, of course. But the one thing that I can do is stop other people from pushing theirs. Mm -hmm. So I try to maintain strict neutrality. That's in short change uh, today, the neutrality, where news uh, have become more entertainment and then it leans to one side or the other. And the actual news, I think, ends up being... Um, not in New York or, or LA anymore, but actually in, in the other states where you have local stations that can focus on actual news and are, are not quite as, as influenced by the either agenda as you wish. Do, do, is, is that your experience as well? That certainly is my experience, yes. I, I think a lot of it has to do with who the management is uh, yeah. and, and what their philosophy is. Some stations are, are more, I would guess I say liberal than others. Mm -hmm. Um, our crew has been there for a long time. We're unusual in that way. Um, we're all, all of my co-anchors are, you know, in the same generation as me. So that's very unusual. And we've all been together for a long time. So uh, we, we are old school journalists. Yeah. And so we did not grow up with this idea that, you know, we could uh, somehow manipulate the news to, uh, for our own ends. But I think what happens, the young reporters come in and now this is a new generation uh, they come in and they just, for them, their views are just right. It's just reality or truth to them because mm -hmm. it is, they feel that they can, um, they don't have, they don't consider themselves as biased because this is just the truth. If you understand what I'm saying. Yeah. Emotion plays into this, that um, if this news piece is offensive to somebody or somebody disagrees with it or something, even though it's a fact, 
and then you're not allowed to say because it might not somebody might not like it and that 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 becomes a, a version of the truth is very super subjective and and has landmines all over the place that there's certain topics you can't even talk about um even scientifically or so um but what, what's interesting to me is you also have an other field you, ha you you're a speaker and and a writer and um, have some very interesting topics that you cover in, in your non, uh, I, I would say almost it's also journalistic, but not in your mainstream journalism. Can you talk a little bit about that and how you came to that? Well, sure. Uh, a number of years ago, I uh, was a, as a reporter, I went to Guatemala to cover a local charity, uh, the head of the charity, and it happened to be at the time Central America's largest charity, uh, was uh, the the CEO of it and the founder happened to be from this this area here, my hometown. So I got to know him because he was so amazing and courageous. I went to Guatemala and I spent some time there and ended up writing a book about this project. So that kind of launched me on a, on a um, uh, literary writing uh, type of thing. And then a few years ago, my father uh, was dying and he was afraid. He was scared. And I, I felt really bad for him because um, you know, he was at the end of his life and, and he seemed so frightened. And so I, in order to try to help him, I started studying uh, and looking for near death experiences and, um, and reasons not to be afraid as you approach death. It ended up, um, my father died, I, I ended up writing this book. It, it uh, was called The Gift of Death. My father died before he could read it. But I think that that was part of God's design actually, because he plays a major role in the book. His death in the end was beautiful and um, peaceful. And so you'd have to read the book to find out what happens, but because uh, I don't want to give it away. But um, it really it really influenced me in ways that I didn't expect. And so um, while I've always been Catholic uh, and always went to mass and raised my children Catholic, um, I wasn't what you would call um, evangelistic, you know, especially being in the news business. I just kind of kept my faith to myself. But after I wrote that book, so many people were so interested and it, it clearly is a topic that people are looking for comfort on and are very interested in. We're all interested in it. We don't talk much about it, but we're all interested in death. You know, it happens to everybody. And so I decided I, I came across, a, I, was, I was on Formed and they were talking about um, a master's degree at the Augustine Institute. Yeah. And I thought in order to really, um, answer questions. I needed a good faith background. And so I did get the master's degree from the Augustine Institute to help me with that. And since then, I'm not exactly sure. I finished that about a year ago. I'm not exactly sure where um, I'm being led in this uh, capacity, perhaps in my role with TLI. It's, um, it's very interesting. But because I now have that degree, uh, people ask me at work even to, uh, you know, they, they have questions and they ask me about it. They assume I'm an expert. So somebody will ask a question, you think you don't know the answer, you start talking and suddenly there it is. So I have found that to be true. Monica, going back to the media and, and you know, you touched on so many, so, many, so many points earlier that I really wanted to pick on. Uh, as you know, I have a media background myself, right? Mm -hmm. And I want to think that I was part of that old school of journalism as well, where I remember in my days, opinion, was never part of a, of a news piece, right? A, a reporter's opinion was the last thing that was important or relevant, right? Where, where today, it seems you, you see it so, so much. Many people, uh, Catholics, are completely tuning off the news media or, or are only going to Catholic news sources. Um, should we give up on the secular media what are Catholics uh, to do with it? Well, I'd hate to see us give up because uh, there, I know a lot of people assume that it's fake news and that it's it's not real. And um, but I also think that it's a mistake to only go to one to one source. So even if it is Catholic media, it's still you're only getting one source. How can you join in the conversation if you don't know what others are thinking? So um, I think it's important to to do both to make yourself aware of what's going on in the Catholic community. Um, but I also think that it's very important to follow the news in other ways. But having said that, it's important to educate yourself on all aspects. So for instance, if you know a particular news uh, station or newspaper or magazine uh, tends toward a conservative view, then look for the opposite view. 
look for both views because then you'll know what people are really thinking and then you can address it because otherwise you're ignorant going into the conversation. You can only, uh, you, you can't really refute something if you don't know where they're coming from. That's my view anyway. So I wonder what your day looks like. Like, I don't know anybody else who's in the news like you, but um, if you're all news all day, like you get up in the morning and you have to like drink from a fire hose to get the news, um, how does that look? Are you literally news, all news all day? Or, or how, how does your day look like? Well, at, at our particular station, we are just an AB, we're an NBC affiliate. So no, we're not all news all day. For me, I get up in the morning and I try, I work in the evening. So I try to um, do all the other things in my life you know, in the morning. And so, but I do, when I get up and drink my coffee, I tend to watch the headlines on CNN and Fox just to see what's going on in the world before I go to work. Uh, if I can't get to that, then of course I do what everybody else does and I check the headlines on my phone. So I do have a general idea of what's going on and I get alerts all day for local news. Uh, so I know what's happening there. Uh, but when I get to work, my job is typically to read everything that everybody is doing. And it's become more challenging too because we subscribe to news services for our national news. And because we have a lot of shows like other stations, we have, we have a lot of time to fill and not that many reporters to fill it. And we don't wanna have one show look exactly like the next show. So we use a lot of national news, but I find I have to watch those because they are slanted very often. They'll give one side or the other. Like if you would do this career over in this place now, right? it's 2022, and to a to a young person, 20 year old, what, what's the advice? Where, where do you go study, and how do you how do you pick those first positions? It's, it's a good time to try to go into journalism if that's truly what your desire is, because uh, we are having trouble recruiting mainly because of uh, uh, you know I think the salary level hasn't caught up uh, mm -hmm. with some other industries, and so. Um, it's discouraging to the best and the brightest sometimes, uh, but yeah, when yeah. somebody is truly interested, I think they go into journalism with a with a missionary spirit. Very often, I, I know I did. You know, you want to you want to go out and 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 fix things, tell the news, um, make things better. And um, so, I would say go to a school that has a good reputation for journalism. But at the same time, I don't think it's a mistake to find out what their philosophy is. Uh, you know, in their department. Uh, that doesn't mean that you're necessarily going to, uh, you know, try to slant the news because you don't want to do that. But uh, I, I also think that you need to fight a little bit against this idea that there's only one view uh, and, and maybe look at the other view. The other thing I think that you need to do in your career, starting out, everybody starts at these small stations, although, you know, you, you move up much faster now because of, of, the, uh, of the dearth of... Um, candidates. So if, you, if you're talented, you'll move up pretty fast. But I think it's to behave with absolute integrity. If you behave with absolute integrity, um, then who you are and your faith is going to shine through, even if you don't, even if you're not overt about it. You know, um, I didn't walk around saying, hey, I'm Catholic. But people, you know, they, they finally, at the end, they, they you know, toward toward the end of this long career, they have realized that obviously um, God plays a role in my life and they're, that's just who I am. And I think that um, that's what Christians have always been told to do is to live the way you want others to see you uh, mm -hmm. as a Christian. In the covering of the news, perhaps you want to, uh, you, you actually have a duty to impartiality and you're striving for that. It seems to me that in your individual private journalistic uh, endeavors like your books, you have a lot more flexibility and there are and probably have been there opportunities to help others uh, reconsider their fate. Do you see that? Has that been your experience? You know, that really is true. Uh, that when I am asked to speak, um, I've spoken to all kinds of different groups, secular, non-secular, um, I mean, different faiths. Uh, because it's a topic that is of interest to everybody. Uh, so I do think that that does provide an opportunity. And also, um, it's much easier to get a book out now than it was 20 years ago, because you can self-publish it. You can, and, and I, in particular, in the, in the, you know, if you get yourself a reputation in journalism, especially in television, you got an automatic audience because, you know, people know who you are. 
it doesn't hurt to have a, an audience already, right? Andreas, you were going to say. Yeah. I just I can't resist to go back to your experience. And, and first of all, your father must have been a wonderful man to inspire you uh, so much to help him uh, get go through death. You know, that's uh, definitely a, a beautiful thing. And so I'm so very sorry for your loss on that. Um, I, I just wrote a book called The Art of Principled Entrepreneurship, and I had the chance to work with this man, Art Sioka, hence The Art of Principled Entrepreneurship. And Art, actually, it was his, the, the last two years of his life. And I have hundreds of hours of interviews with him, uh, in which we wrote about his, his life and what he learned. He was 87 years old. Uh, one of the greatest, I think, one of the greatest Catholic CEOs of the last 50 to 100 years. He, he's the guy who started the um, second largest, he created the second largest wine company in the United States. And he was somebody who went very peacefully into death. And um, I wish I would have learned about your work earlier because I would, used, I would have used some of your questions and some of your points um, uh, with him. But he, he ended up having a very beautiful and, 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 and peaceful, uh, peaceful death. How, of what you learned, there's two pertinent questions to me. How do I prepare? Everybody's going to think of this, every one of our listeners. How do I prepare for a death like that? And then the second question is, how do I help others through their grief? I think uh, my book actually tells a lot of stories of people facing death. And so I think the stories in themselves are comforting because, uh, you know, there's a lot of it's really well documented that very many people are met at the moment of death by somebody that they love or somebody that they trust. And I think hearing about those stories, it, you, you can't make that happen for yourself. So um, there's just an awful lot of um, even even people who don't necessarily have strong faith still have these experiences. But I think really the biggest thing is to just not be afraid to look at it. That's the biggest thing. We, you know, instead of just turning off the, the subject, it's like, I'm scared of that. And so I don't want to think about it. Face it. Because I think if you face it and look at it, really look at it, you're going to find great comfort in that instead of fear. And that, that was the goal that I was trying to... Um, to get across with my book. Uh, you know, at the, at the time that I wrote it, I didn't have the religious, um, you know, the educational theological background that I have now. I might have written it a little differently had I had that. In fact, mm -hmm. probably should write another one. But um, so it's pretty, it's, it's pretty, it's an easy read. Let me put it that way. It's not real deep in, in, into theology. But I think in some ways that's comforting too, because you hear about other people's experiences and, and you hope for that yourself. And almost inevitably, when I talk to a group about death and I start telling some of these stories, they have stories of their own that they want to share. And so it, it, it's just, it's an amazing topic really. And we need to get more deeply into it, I believe. Uh, and now I've talked myself out of knowing what your second question was. How do you help those who, who are grieving, you know? Ah, yes. Again, Last question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, I think that the way to help them is to sit with them in their grief, not try to explain it away, not try to say, you know, also face it. Yes. Face it, look at it, um, realize that the person that went is, is, uh, is fine, but that that doesn't mean that you don't miss them and that you're not, you know, your grief is very real. But I think more, more than anything, it's sitting with them in their grief and not trying to explain it away because it, very often what we're trying to do is make ourselves feel better and ourselves more comfortable by saying something like, oh, you know, they're an angel now or um, God needed them more than you did or something like that. I don't think that those things are helpful. I think what's helpful is to say, I'm so sorry that happened. Um, you know, what can I do? What, you know, can I just sit here with you? I think that people just need to be accompanied very often in their grief. Monica Hannan, thank you so much for being with us today. It's been a pleasure talking to you. And thank you for our, having me. And to our viewers, thank you so much for, for joining us. Uh, we ask you to please like, comment, and share this video so we can attain its maximum exposure. Yes, thank you all. Um, Monica, it's, it, it's super interesting. My deep respect for the work and thanks for the work that you're doing and for spending some time with us. And for you, uh, viewers and listeners, thank you for uh, watching. It's really a privilege to have you guys with us uh, for a few minutes a day. And we'll see you next time. Thank you for helping us spread the word about our uh, mission here and to help, uh, help others, other lay Catholic uh, professionals, 
spread the gospel in the world. Thank you.